Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos and today we're going to talk about the W.E.B. Du Bois house behind me in the Morgan Park neighborhood in northeast Baltimore and it may come as a surprise to some of us that W.E.B. Du Bois, the famous uh, scholar and intellect and pioneer in the civil rights movement, uh, lived here in Baltimore uh, but he did for a number of years. As I was thinking about this video, I was kind of having a debate in my mind about what to call the house, whether to call it the W.E.B. Du Bois house or call it the house where W.E.B. Du Bois lived. And I know that's maybe getting into semantics a little bit too much, but I think it's important. If a house gets somebody's name, it ought to have been a part of their life story and not just a place where they lived for a while. We've got other houses and buildings with people's names. Um, the across town in West Baltimore, the H.L. Mencken house, the famous editor of the Baltimore Sun, who famously said that the house was as much a part of them as his own two hands. I think that's fair to call that house his. Um, we've got the Mitchell Law Office, also in West Baltimore, where Juanita Jackson Mitchell, the first African-American uh, woman lawyer in Maryland, and her husband Clarence, launched so many uh, important civil rights uh, efforts and lawsuits. I think it's fair to call that building theirs. And, and I think I'm going to conclude by saying it is more than fair to call this building the W.E.B. Du Bois House. Uh, but let's see. So before we get to the house, let's start with the man. Uh, William Edward Burgart Du Bois was born in 1868. He grew up in Massachusetts and went to college at Fisk University in, uh, in Nashville. And maybe not for the first time, but certainly here he experienced racism uh, on a widespread scale that influenced him greatly. But whatever else was going on outside the classroom, uh, his brain was definitely going on inside the classroom. He excelled at Fisk, not satisfied with one bachelor's degree. He went to Harvard, enrolled at Harvard, and got a second bachelor's degree, uh, graduating with the top academic honors. Uh, spent a couple years in Berlin at the University of Berlin, then came back to Harvard and became the first African American to earn a PhD from Harvard University. His thesis, and let me read this, was called The Suppression of the African Slave Trade in the United States, 1638 to 1870. And it was the first piece published by the then new Harvard Historical studies series. Um, after earning his PhD, he took kind of a year interlude and uh, taught college in Ohio, where he taught Greek and Latin. Um, who knew that this uh, pioneering civil rights intellect was also a classic scholar, but he was. Um, and then he went uh, to teach at the University of Pennsylvania and eventually settled in at Atlanta University. And it was from there in 1905 um, that he helped launch the Niagara Movement, uh, one of the first organizations and organizing efforts. Uh, around civil rights in the country. In many ways, that uh, came on the shoulders of an earlier movement from the 1880s, about 20 years before, uh, from our own Harvey Johnson, Reverend Harvey Johnson, uh, who organized the Mutual Brotherhood of Liberty movement uh, from Union Baptist Church in West Baltimore. Johnson was a, a, a friend of Du Bois's and was a co-founder of the Niagara movement as well. That movement, their goal, and let me read, they said, we claim for ourselves every Every right that belongs to a freeborn American, political, civil, and social. And until we get these rights, we will never cease to protest. Um, that was the Niagara movement. They lasted until uh, just about three years, until 1908, when they disbanded to make way for the NAACP. Du Bois was one of the five co-founders of that organization um, and was, in fact, the founder and editor-in-chief of the monthly magazine, the NAACP's monthly magazine called The Crisis, really the megaphone for civil rights uh, uh, thoughts and actions uh, for decades. And he was editor-in-chief for decades. In 1919, he also was the organizer for the Second Pan-African Congress um, in Paris. Um, the Second Pan-African Congress is credited as being uh, the origins of today's Pan-African movement that obviously still continues to shape the world today. By 1939, he was still teaching uh, in Atlanta, or he left the NAACP and was teaching in Atlanta, and, uh, and decided he needed a house here in Baltimore. His daughter Yolanda and her family were here. Uh, she was a teacher, so he uh, bought two parcels in Morgan Park, uh, commissioned an architect and builder, C.J. Uh, uh, White, uh, to do this. And although this is not the uh, grandest or fanciest house in Baltimore or even in Morgan Park, it is a wonderful 
wonderful house and he loved it and he loved Morgan Park. He moved in in 1939 with his wife um, and his daughter and her family. Of Morgan Park, he said, he wrote, he, he appreciated it because it was near a university and not across the railroad tracks. Um, and he lived here and worked here for over a decade. Um, from here, he continued to publish seminal pieces, uh, including uh, three, Dawn, uh, Dust to Dawn, 1940, Color of Democracy, 1945, and The World in Africa, 1946. Um, so he might have been a parent and grandparent here and husband, but he was also still very much a scholar um, and, uh, and a political uh, activist as well. Um, so uh, he, he ends up selling the house in 1951. Uh, his wife, Nina, of over 50 years, had just passed away, and he decided it was time to move on. Um, uh, uh, and his last couple years were somewhat tumultuous. Uh, the Department of Justice indicted him for his uh, work with an organization that he was chair of called the Peace Information Center. They had been gathering up uh, initiatives, uh, peace initiatives from other countries and sharing them here in the United States. The Department of Justice apparently did not like that. Um, at age 93, he joined the Communist Party um, and then shortly after became a citizen of Ghana. He died in 1963, literally a day before the March on Washington. And although at that point, some of the new generation of leaders had con considered him maybe somewhat of a dinosaur uh, and somewhat out of step with the current thinking, um, he was praised on the first day of the March of Washington and to this day is considered uh, one of the leading intellects and leading champions, leading pioneers in the civil rights uh, area. So uh, let's wrap up by going back to the house and whether it deserves uh, the name uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. And I think it very much does. He's the one, after all, who had it built. He published uh, not one or two, but three seminal works here. And in his own words, he identified the stages of his life with houses. Let me read to you from a quote from, of his later in life. He said, somehow I remember life, curiously enough, chiefly as a succession of homes, the settlement in Philly at 7th and Lombard in the slums, then Harlem and Harlem and Harlem, and finally the new cottage in Baltimore. Home was a shifting backdrop with gay wings for the drama of life, gay and grim. Um, so very much identif he is identifying uh, his stages of life with his house. So I'm going to conclude by saying I think we all uh, should come out here and take a look and call it the W.E.B. Du Bois house, uh, but with one caveat. In 1951, when he sold the house, he sold it to a couple named Leo and Geneva Woods, and they lived here and raised their family here. Um, and if you look behind me, the house is in wonderful shape. They have been great caretakers. Um, and to this day, the house is owned by the Woods family. Um, that's right. It has only ever had two family owners. So I think uh, in reality, uh, we should most accurately be calling this the W.E.B. Du Bois house with a subtitle also known as the Woods House. All right, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.